Good. Um, well, we've got a uh, panel for you to talk to you today about uh, lager. We're figuring that sort of um, lager is becoming quite a big part of brewing these days, a lot more craft lagers, um, a lot more development of um, beers that are brewed locally, which are lagers, in competition with the big, massively uh, brewed lagers as well. So, so to give a bit more into everyone's CV as to, I guess, why we're here, I'm going to read this to make sure I don't get this wrong. So we have George Young, uh, the brewing director of St. Austell Family Group that produces 180,000 barrels of beer a year out of St. Austell and Bath Ales breweries, including the award-winning Korev Lager. And there is a hat and sunglasses as well. Um, Jeremy Swainson, head brewer at Utopian Brewing in Devon, specializing in brewing classic lagers with British ingredients. Uh, he learned brewing in Germany and studied at Dürrmann's Academy in Munich. And Ben Adams has been in beer for almost 20 years, the first 10 uh, as a brewer, and he's currently in charge of special projects at Charles Fairham. Uh, and yes, I'm Mark Dredge. I am primarily a beer writer. I wrote a book called A Brief History of Lager, which I suppose is why, uh, how I qualified to sit here with these, these wonderful people. We'll continue. Okay, um, I think let's begin by talking about the current lager hops, or classic lager hops. I think that's a good place to begin. So Ben, do you want to talk us a little bit about classic lager hops and perhaps how they might be used in different styles? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so classic lager hops is a bit of a difficult one. We get asked often what's the, what's the hop I should be putting in a lager, and it's a difficult question uh, because there are so many different types of lager. Uh, it's not a single style. There are different, lots of different types of uh, beers that sit in within the sort of the lager um, umbrella. So classically, well, we're talking about European varieties. Lager started in Europe. That's where it was starting to be developed, and so we're looking sort of around Munich, around the Bavarian area. And so the hops you're talking about there are things like Tetnang and Mittelfru, um, all from the Hallertau. So those are the beers that would have first been used to brew lagers with. The really big jump and the beer that's become the predominant uh, style in the lager group is Pilsner. And that was taken across in the 1840s um, and started to be brewed uh, in Pilsen in Czechoslovakia as then. And the hops they were using then, or in that local area, were Sartz. And so Sartz has become the sort of predominant lager hop. If someone asked me what is the lager variety, it would probably be Sartz, because that is the biggest hop in, in Pilsner, which is the predominant variety. Um, but it, it depends how authentic you want to get. Um, so the real thing is for al almost all lager varieties, um, they're not trying to overpower the beer. So lager varieties, uh, lager hop varieties will classically try and match and balance with the, with the beer itself. And you're, so you're not looking for big fruity characteristics, you're looking for earthy and herbal and floral characteristics. And so all of the classic lager hop varieties sit within that sort of area. So you're talking sort of high farnesine contents and some of that woody herbal character, low in myrcene, so you're not getting some of the big rich fruit character, which you might want in an IPA. In, um, so you're, you're kind of looking for those kind of characteristics. Within those hops, there is um, it's quite a lot of variation. So you'll find with something like a Sartz, it's got a definite spicier edge than something like a Mittelfru or a Tetnang. And that fits with the slight spicier, the slightly more assertive bitterness you get in a Pilsner as opposed to a Helles. So they do sort of match, but it's, it's, those, it's those floral, herbal, spicy, earthy characteristics which run throughout them all, um, I would say. Okay, um, so I think if we start by talking now about perhaps the core brands or core lager beers that you are both brewing, I think let's talk about how you're specifically brewing those. I think maybe talking about your equipment, because obviously you're brewing in a couple of different, a couple of different breweries. Jeremy has a brewery that's designed specifically for brewing lager beers. So I think talk a little bit about how you're brewing these beers with some hop specifics in there. Sure. So, um, Korov was created in 20, 2008, actually, and I can take no credit for that. What That was the late Roger Ryman who created this great beer. And it started, really, because, obviously, the passion that he had for lager and the fact that Cornwall has wonderfully soft water that we've just heard uh, Derek talking about. So, that really is the starting point when you've got, you know, the right water to start with. Um, and then, you know... Helles are above 4.6% ABV, so the trials that we um, 
settled on with 4.8% ABV. And the hops that we were looking at was, again, some of the, uh, you know, traditional, there is Sartes um, in uh, Corriff. There is also the Herzbrucker. We do also bitter with Magnum. Um, and I think uh, what you find with that is you get um, a, a sort of a soft bitterness coming through, but you also get quite a nice, like you say, spicy. There is a little bit of a, a herbal note there. And um, it, it's, you know, it just balances along with that malt that, that you're using. Now, down at St. Austell, obviously, it's a traditional ale brewery. So, you know, we have a mash tun. Um, so, therefore, we have to, um, you know, be very careful of runoff to make sure the runoff is very slow, that we aren't, you know, dragging through too much of the polyphenols at the end, keeping the, the pH and the balance right so that those hops can really come through and show the character. Obviously, boil is really important with lagers as well because you want to drive off your, your, you know, your sulfur flavors and your self, uh, methyl methionine so that you're um, you know, not left with too much sulfur, which can then also um, cloud those, those hop varieties coming through. Um, and I think, you know, Corev is a very drinkable beer. You know, you get that balance of that hop, a slightly, you know, floral note um, and, you know, a, a sort of a light popcorn, we call it, coming through. We have had challenges over the last couple of years with the, the SARTs, um, you know, poor quality harvests that we've had with SARTs and also, you know, the price escalating because, you know, that's really important to brewers. Otherwise, we wouldn't still all be here. So, um, and, uh, so we have been looking at using Lubelski or not, you know, we've been using Lubelski, which is a Polish variety and substituting that for a lot of the SARTs. We haven't found any detrimental effect t to that at all. In fact, you know, no comments whatsoever or detections on the flavor panel. So I can really, um, if I'm allowed to, say that that's a, you know, a, a good substitution <laughs> for Zarts. Um, and I think, you know, Karev has, you know, grown from being, uh, you know, a, a lager that has, um, you know, that w when you start a brand, 2008, you know, things take time to develop. And that, that beer now is selling, you know, just over 20,000 barrels a year of, of lager. Um, across the UK, which, which is fantastic. But as Mark alluded to, we don't just make it at us an Austell brewery. We also have a, uh, recently put in a canning line up at the Bath Ales brewery, a KHS line. So, um, you know, modern, uh, you know, very lucky to have a very modern filling technique so that we can actually have very, very low dissolved oxygen levels. And the, the uh, curve that we're brewing up there is actually made with a mash conversion vessel and a lauter. It's a very different technique to the way that we make it at St. Austell. But again, you know, the, it's a different recipe. If you look at the two brew sheets, and uh, you know, they are slightly different quantities of the malt. We've also got some acidulated malt in there. We're also you're buffering the pH a bit better. I should point out at Bath, we have reverse osmosis. So we're not relying on hard Bristol water, using the same hop varieties, but in slightly different ways, m using more um, going into the whirlpool at the end of the process. If I'm being really, really honest, you're probably getting a slightly cleaner, crisper Corev. It's really, really hard to detect. But if you have a can of Corev um, and you're sitting there with your keg, your cod, I mean, don't go down the pub with your cans. Well, you could do <laughs> and see what you think. But, um, you know, it, it's a pretty good match. But again, having to adapt the additions just slightly, going in a little bit later, um, at, uh, at the end of the boil, and also as at cask, we've got those uh, those hot pellets going in and into the whirlpool as as the work comes through. So, um, but the recent experiments have been that Lubelski has been an absolutely fine substitution for Sarts. To me, the the, the key to any successful lager, and I think um, the fact that Korev has won some really big awards, uh, you know, it won gold in international brewing awards in keg and in small pack, was because we've had a massive drive on quality to reduce dissolved oxygen. And if you can get your oxygen levels really low, and we're typically below 80 parts per billion now on every brew, you really can get those hop characteristics really coming through and that clean and crisp flavour to your customer. And that's really important, you know, with those, for those hop flavours. So... Um, yeah, so thanks for that. Uh, so the beer that we've got here today is uh, our Goldings Pills. So I'll just talk a bit about the process that went into that. It's sort of, um, we start with a, with a traditional 
German Pilsner recipe, so it's 100% lager malt and quite dry, but it's uh, hopped far more aggressively than uh, a traditional German Pils might be. Um, something I have to add to that uh, is we, at Utopian Brewing, we only use uh, British ingredients. Um, so all of our decisions uh, around recipe formulation are based in, you know, how do we make continental lagers with, with um, uh, English malts and hops. So for the, for the pills, um, we're starting with uh, a blend of lager malts from Warminster and from uh, Baird's, which are more in the continental style, so a bit higher nitrogen. And uh, that allows us to do a decoction mash. So we're, we're doing a double decoction. Um, so we're uh, yeah, boiling the mash uh, twice. And, um, and then, yeah, I mean, that that's sort of goes into the technological differences. So the second you're doing a decoction, you can't run a traditional mash ton because you'll knock uh, all the air out of it. And, uh, and your mash won't float. So, we're, so we use essentially a lauder ton. Um, yeah, and then in this beer, we're using Golding's hops, which to me are a bit like a noble hop, like a, a European style hop, but grown in the, in the UK. So they've got a lot of that um, herbal, earthy, um, spicy, slightly fruity character, but it's all very mild. Um, so we're using... Uh, quite a lot of Goldings in this beer. We're using a hop back uh, with a bit of whole cone um, and we're dry hopping um, for this specific recipe. Um, yeah, in, in terms of uh, how to make a lager taste good in general, um, we, we use you know, the, funding, the founding principles of clean fermentation, cold temperature, uh, long maturation and trying to keep dissolved oxygen low, of course. Um, that, that's sort of the key principles to making a beer that's super clean and, uh, and drinks easily. So, um, yeah. Great. So I think while you're talking about the beers that you're brewing, what's interesting to me is that you're using all British ingredients. But as in your past as a brewer, you've been using, brewing lots of lagers with German hops. So can you talk a little bit about the differences or similarities between brewing classic lager recipes with German hops and with English hops? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I, I really see it, um, when, when I was asked to make you know, a Helles with English hops, my initial thought was, okay, this is going to be a bit tricky, um, but really it's just a bit of mental uh, um, aerobics that you have to do. You know, we, we think of EKG and Fuggles as being, you know, a lot of people say, oh, they're very earthy. You know, um, they're nothing like Saz or Hollertau, but actually, um, I think if you brew lagers um, with them, they, they come across in very similar uh, ways. Um, some of the ways that we look, that the, the sort of um, the German school of looking at hops and assessing their quality is about cleanliness of, a, of uh, how clean is the aroma. So we're not looking for intense notes of citrus, anything like that. And uh, also the oil composition um, and sort of like the alpha to beta um, uh, relationship, which is how you define a noble hop. Um, so for a lot of the lagers that we're brewing, we're trying to use low alpha hops, which will have a higher um, beta to alpha ratio than uh, more high alpha acid hops. Um, yeah, and, and some of the techniques from, um, from brewing German lagers would be uh, you know, typically you're going to boil the hops for at least 10 minutes to flash off the mercine content in them. So for our Helles Lager, where we're looking for a super crisp, super clean, uh, the last addition's 10 minutes before the end of boil. And then in some of the newer styles where we're using uh, hops like Harlequin or Mystic, we sort of throw out the rule book and yeah, you can go in the Whirlpool, dry hop, all that good stuff. And whirlpool hopping is not something you would see as a, in a traditional German brewery? Um, n not really. Uh, I've, not the breweries that I've seen. Um, of course, you'll find exceptions to the rule. Um, yeah, the, the Germans are super conservative with their hopping. So usually, yeah, 10 minutes before the end of the boil, last edition goes in. I'm sure there's a handful of breweries that use whole cone that will operate something like a hop back or breweries that'll chuck 
uh, some hops into like a uh, in, into a cool ship. I'm thinking of some old breweries in Franconia, but that's definitely the exception to the rule. Okay, so I think now let's have a think about ales versus lagers. So can we talk a bit about differences or similarities between brewing an ale and brewing a lager and how the hops behave? And I think thinking more about the colder, longer fermentation and then the longer maturation. Yeah, sure. I was just thinking we haven't mentioned yeast yet, have we, and things like that. So, um, uh, so if we were making an ale, obviously we have a hop back and we would be using whole cone hop as well and putting our hop work through that. To, we try and do as much of that hopping on the hot side rather than the cold side uh, before a warm fermentation of uh, starting at 15 degrees. Whereas obviously with Korev, we are cooling down to 10 um, and then adding a different yeast strain. Now, our yeast strains are just from the National Yeast Collection. It has a number, R674. You, anyone can go and get it. Um, it's something I would be interested in looking at because I think it's, um, it is quite hard to work with. It's quite sticky. It doesn't flocculate very well. And... Um, you know, but that's a that's a really big piece of work to to try and do that and to change that. Um, but from a, you know a hot point of view, again, that maturation time, you know, is is really important to make sure that you have got, uh, you know, the 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 fermentation taking. You know, it's colder, so it takes a longer time. It's taking at least seven days. You then want to make sure that you haven't got any diacetyl, so that's reabsorbed. So we then have a warmer temperature. Um, you know, that should then. You know, there aren't enough hops there, I think, to react with the yeast anyway, you know, to cause any um, of the sort of slightly, you know, reactions that we would now be seeing typical in IPAs and things like that with biotransformation. So I think that's all, that's all sort of gone and done, you know, but I think it's really important to have that time. And then obviously with any lager, it's really important to have that cold uh, conditioning process. Um, before you hit the filter. And at the end of the day, it's your filtration process where you really are hoping not to take too much out. Now, we have cross flow filtration because it's a lot more gentle than um, Kieselger and plate and frame, and that's again, keeps the hop flavors and the compounds in. Um, and again, what I've just spent an awful lot of money on, which really wasn't very exciting, was a new fridge plant. But if you haven't got cooling and you can't keep your fermentations, whether they're ale or lagers, uh, under control, um, you know, you lose control of your beer. So that has been, um, I don't think we'd have got through this summer without that fridge plant, if I'm really honest. So um, not too much on about hops there. But, you know, if you don't get those processes right, you lose the characters because they get masked by the off flavours and, you know, not having a clean fermentation. Yeah, there's just, just to touch on that piece. Um, f for a long time, hops used in lagers have been the hops that were available. They're the hops that were next to the, the brewery or close to the brewery. So it's only uh, sort of in recent, in the last sort of few decades, where we've been able to ship hops all over the world and we can kind of pick and choose what we want. Um, people have just been using the hops next to them. And that's, you know, that's made the beer what it is. And I think the hops in lager have generally been the fourth most important ingredient. Whereas we all know they're the first most important ingredient in, in most styles. But... Um, yeah, so they, they, they've been what is available. And I think that is changing slightly um, and people are being uh, adding different things and, and looking for different flavours. And as you say, we're now starting to... Both of you guys are whirlpooling, whereas 100 years ago, whirlpooling, wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. You would just be putting your first edition. So things are adapting and things are evolving. But um, yeah, it was what hops you had right next to you for, for a long time, classically. Yeah, just to, to add on the differences between ale and lager brewing, um, so just something that came to mind, um, for mashing between the two sites, do you do a step mash at Bath versus... No, it's not a step mash, it's, it's, um, it's still, but it, it has got a mash mixer. So if it doesn't hit the right temperature, you can heat it up. But it's not, it's not, a, it's not a traditional step mash, and we're not doing decoction. We could do, you know, so... If, if you wanted, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, no, so, I mean, the, a, bi a big difference with brewing lager is traditionally we're using step mashes and, uh, yeah, the old school method when you didn't have a direct way of heating the mash tun is decoction. Um, nowadays, uh, most German or Czech, well, German brewers would just do a step mash without a decoction. Czech brewers are still all doing decoctions, otherwise you can't call it 
um, check PIVO, which is protected status. Um, but yeah, so that's so so how we mash um, is is quite a big difference um, between the beer styles and and lagers are traditionally really light. So any way that we can get more body, more foam potential into the beer is really important, which is why we do decoction for a lot of our beers. Um, you're sort of breaking down the grain more than you would in a single infusion mash, releasing more um, nitrogen matter, polyphenols, which are also um, uh, foam and body uh, positive. Um, but yeah, in terms of, of uh, hopping, the differences between our we, we have started doing some cask ale, just very small amounts. Um, yeah, usually we're aggressively hopping the ales compared to the lagers that we're making. In terms of bitterness, could we talk a bit about the bitterness units that you might find in, say, a Pilsner and versus a Pale Ale? Because the drinking characteristics of those styles are not the same. So I'm kind of interested in how the uh, the amount of hops you're adding and the amount of bitterness you're getting from them translates to drinking character. Yeah, I think um, obviously a, a, a typical, you know, a proper job, your bitternesses are up at sort of 35 to 40 bitterness units when you're punchy, you know, grapefruit flavours coming through. Um, I sort of almost want, want, want you to go back for more. Um, but then you take a traditional sort of, you know, London Pride or something, you know, you're, you're down more at the sort of early 20s and you do that malt character, you know, it can become quite insatiating on the on the palate. But if you're down at, you know, a Corev, you're sort of bit, uh, down within the sort of, you know, between 15 and 20. We don't actually measure bitterness routinely and regularly. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, high hop can sometimes um, be quite challenging for people. Um, and, you know, it is all about personal taste. Um, so, yeah, I think bitterness units, um, again, it's so hard to measure bitterness as well. It's, you know, the, you know, it can be off the scale between plus or 10 units, you know. So um, depends how many times you, you do this with your ISO octane. But uh, so, yeah, t to me, it, you, it, it's personal taste, but it, it's the, um, you know, the, the lower bitterness I, th I find more you know, easy drinking for a lot of people. Yeah, I think definitely, you know, for the purpose of this discussion, a lot of the brewers out there now, uh, we want to create lagers that will compete with the macros on taps. You want, you know, a house lager in on your, on the bar at your tap room. Um, and, and those beers, the, the beers that people expect when they order a lager at the bar, they're sort of 20 IBUs or, or less. Um, I guess the exception might be something like Camden Hells, which is actually quite high. It's closer to 30 or something. Um, but the Pilsners, so, so we're doing a single hop series of, of uh, pills, and they're all sort of 35 IBUs, roughly. Um, but then we can't sell them in any appreciable volume. We've tried. It doesn't work. So we make lots of Hellas, and, uh, and, and I make uh, pills every couple months for fun. Delicious, and I hope you carry on doing that. Um, so we, I think we talked about classic lagers, and the hop character in classic lagers is typically balanced. It's almost the defining characteristic that we get from these beers is a beautiful balance between the malt, the fermentation, uh, and the hops. But there are so many more evolutions in lager these days, and people are using hops in different ways in them. We're seeing cold IPAs, we're seeing IPLs, we're seeing more and more dry hop lagers, Italian pilsners, New Zealand pilsners. There is this modern flavor of lager that now has the classic characteristic of modern hops. Let's talk about dry hopping in modern lagers, or at least aromatically hopping modern lagers. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll go for that. Um, so in the past year and a half, we've done a, uh, or two, two years ago, I guess we started with our Pilsner program, which was uh, initially Jester. So uh, since we're all British, we've never done sort of a Citra hopped or Simcoe hopped uh, pills. But yeah, we started with Olakana, Jester, um, Godiva, um, experimenting with dry hopping with uh, increasing volumes of hops in the Whirlpool. Uh, and then this year that sort of expanded into, we did a single hop Harlequin, which is super aromatic. Um, 
and, uh, and the Goldings and a Mystic Pills, and they're all sort of six gram per liter dry hops, um, which for us is a lot. Um, I guess the, the, so we ferment at nine degrees, that's the, that's the highest temperature we get to, so our dry hops are also at nine degrees, um, so we get a different sort of hop aroma um, extracted from dry hops at the lower temperature. Um, I guess it's, it's probably not quite as intense aroma that's coming off of the hops, but it's also very clean. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we have tried in the past doing a warmer fermentation for a lager that was destined to be dry hopped, and we found that the, it sort of produced an excess amount of sulfur, which then mixed with the dry hop character in a way that we didn't quite agree with. Yeah, I think um, where we would probably do dark lagers and you know experiment with dry hopping is in our small batch program, and uh, this is um, so we have a ten barrel uh, brewery where the I let the brewers almost brew whatever they like, you know, it is and uh, if it's cask, we can do th um, three three casks a month, so basically one a week that goes out to the cask club. So all these pubs will get a different cask. I know some of the guys have just come back from the IBD study tour where they were obviously inspired by, um, that was into uh, uh, Prague, and they obviously went out and saw Budvar and Pilsner Ocal, and they've come back and done a, um, a dark lager, uh, which they've called Hourglass, um, and that looks really interesting. And, and you know, um, they've, they've sort of quite been quite... Um, experimental with the hops there. Don't ask me what variety they've used. I, that, that's failing on my part, but uh, that's, uh, they're really excited about that. So, you know, we do tinker around um, trying to do different things on the small batch program that, that, that the brewers can play with. So, Yeah, just to touch on some of the, the IPLs and the cold IPAs you were talking about, there is, it is, lagers, well, all beers evolving, and lagers especially as a, as a um, sort of new styles coming out and being invented, and a lot of those are hop driven. They're people who've been brewing and drinking IPAs for 10 years, um, but want to try and can bring some of that character into lagers um, with varying degrees of success. You haven't got, um, because of the temperature, you're not extracting the same things um, out of the hops. And because you have, you've got a, um, a milder yeast character and mild um, and softer water uh, and light malts generally, you've got less room to hide and so you can often find that some of these hops are overpowering um, not always but you that's uh, something that can happen um, but there's you can still brew any lager with almost any hop that I can remember when um, and I'm not for a moment saying this is an epitome of a lager but when Guinness brought out their hop house they were putting galaxy in it which is not anywhere in the first hundred choices of hops you might think of as a lager, but it worked, it was okay, and it gave, at light rates, it gave, uh, it gave a light rate. So there is, um, there's more people experimenting with lots of different things, um, and that's the, the best thing to do, is really have an idea of where you want to head up, where, where, you, where, you, where you want to end up, and just trying to find different routes. Um, so there's a lot of that happening at the moment, rather than being really trying to be authentic or trying to do the same thing that they do at Pilsner or Cal. And that makes lager exciting for me. You know, we're in a period of, I guess, extra enjoyment for a lager. People wanting to drink more of it, regardless of where you are in, you know, as a drinker or, or a brewer. More and more people want to be drinking lagers now, and it's become almost an essential style for at least a brewery to have in their tap room or hopefully in their range or a style like that. So for me, this is really exciting to be able to discuss how hops can play into that because hops are such a big part of the language of craft beer, or the language of brewing nowadays, people understand those things and those words. So if we can combine lager with those flavors that they're maybe more aware of, you know, we've got this great opportunity. Um, I think I'll have one more, one more question, then we can open it out to other people. It's, I guess, the future, or what's exciting about British lager right now? On a day like this, when it's really hot, <laughs> I'm absolutely <laughs> melting. Um, and being a huge cask advocate, there's a lot of excitement about lager right now. <laughs> um, I think it's just great that everyone's experimenting, but you know, you have to, you, you know, it is about that colder temperature, that longer lagering time, you know, to bring out 
the to make sure that sorry to make sure that the the, the, the there isn't damage to showcase the hops and that and that's the whole point the techniques of making lager you know it's really hard making a lager because you know you have to um, make sure that you you have those clean spicy you know floral like herby notes coming through but not so pronounced you know in a classic lager but, you know like you say what's exciting is that people are experimenting and using more hops to make different styles so and creating our own style for the UK yeah absolutely agree with that um, I think w what's really interesting for for me at the moment is um, you know the UK uh, a lot of brewers have been have spent years making ales um, lo lots of brewers are also making lagers of course but brewers who have focused on something other than lager for years then coming in and approaching lager brewing with a different perspective is really fascinating because then you question all right well why do you step mash why do you use the hops that you use why is a why do, why do you have to make a pilsner recipe you know a smash uh, to, to replicate pilsner or kel um, so so yeah so I think we will see quite a lot of innovation, which is super exciting. And um, yeah, just excited to see what comes out. Yeah, I'd, I'd completely echo that. I mean, when I was growing up, lager drinkers were louts. Um, ale drinkers were old men. And I was a you know, farmer, so I drank cider. And that was, you know, that was the, w the way things were thought about. And now we've had this big craft beer revolution, which has been centered on ale. And you can see now lager is coming in and people are exactly as you said, approaching lager in the same way and looking at in a different way and looking at it from a different perspective um, and playing. So it's really exciting. Um, I'm excited to see the future of lager brewing in the UK, kind of in this room and then everyone coming back next year with, with their lagers. Yeah, for sure. And for me, I absolutely love the flavor of English hops and lagers. I think that is really for me, a, I guess a, pa a passion for me at the moment just particularly golding as well. I think it's such a good lager hop. Um, but there's so much potential, I think, for combining classic lager brewing with the wonderful British hops that we've got right now. These German hops are great, and they obviously they've worked brilliantly in lagers for a very long time. But I think some of the British hops we've got right now are making such incredible lagers. Richard, I've got to tell you a funny story. Okay, so uh, at my previous employers, we created something called Frontier, and um, it was called L Lagered for Longer, 42 Days. A massive campaign went out about lagering for 42 days, and we did lager it for 42 days. We had to buy millions of pounds worth of tanks, and you'd go into every pub, and you'd say, yeah, you know, the, the comms were so good, everyone knew that this lager was lagered for 42 days. It was actually, you know, fermented for seven and then lager for 34. But um, what was quite funny, when I then challenged th this, why was that decision made? Because I'd left Fuller's for a while to have a family. And um, it was kind of like, oh, just to, just to uh, uh, just plucked it out of the air. There was absolutely no science behind that 42 days at all. It was just to sort of, you know, tease the board reduce that um, lagering time because you had to. You couldn't continue that um, time. So actually taking uh, four to five days off didn't have a detrimental effect to the flavor panel. And we were using BRI in the flavor um, uh, panel, you know, independent, you know, a lot there. Um, if I'm honest, at St. Austell, you know, it's a real challenge to keep it within the eight, you know, we say 21, but actually at this time of the year, you'll be pushing it between 18. And actually you do you know, you just have to keep an eye on on that, um, on those flavors, and just make sure it's there. But it is that it's that cold point that I think is the most important. You know, we can put ALDC in and knock a few days out. Uh, you know, to re so you're not having to do your diastole. But it's, um, yeah, it is that cold that for the before it hits the filter is the really important part. Um, yeah. So so we sort of work backwards from uh, a week at zero degrees uh, is the minimum time at zero to allow it to be filterable and, and cold stable. Um, 
and uh, yeah, I mean, lagering can, can mean different things depending how your fermentation profile goes. So we ferment at nine and then, you know, before it finishes fermenting, we start chilling the beer to five degrees. So we don't do a, a diacetyl rest. Um, typically it takes our beers about 18 days to pass diacetyl um, at five degrees. So we hold it at five until, until it passes diac and then a week at zero. So um, for, for our core range, it's about four weeks. Uh, so, so 28 days minimum total tank time. Um, and uh, for, for certain beers, like a, a s anything that's stronger, that's gonna take longer to ferment um, and longer for the diacetyl to, to be taken up again, uh, that's gonna increase it, you know, total tank time to maybe six weeks. Um, for, for our Hellas, you know, like, like everybody did, you probably had a lot of beer sat around during the pandemic when the pubs shut. Uh, we, we had Hellas in tank for, you know, two, three months, four months. Um, it doesn't get appreciably better, it gets brighter, but that's how we lager. Um, so, so something like Pilsner or Kell or Budweiser, Budvar, you, you know, you hear stories of places that lager their beers for ages. But if they're running a fermentation that, you know, they don't do any diac rest and it's, you know, a degree colder a day from, you know, their, the, the high point of fermentation and you've essentially arrested your fermentation, then it could take a month and a half for the diacetyl to be reduced, for the beer to clean up, uh, and, and for the extract to be fully um, fermented. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it depends if you do a modern fermentation. If you do a diac rest, it'll speed things up. Uh, our way is sort of a middle ground between tradition and practicality. Uh, we've got time for one quick question. And then we're Um, it's uh, f for a couple of reasons. Um, so I guess uh, yeah, the the larger the temperature difference that your yeast has to work in in general, um, uh, the, the larger that difference is. I think that's a stress on the yeast. So if you go up to fourteen or sixteen degrees, and then you crash it to to crop it, and then it's stored in a fridge at zero, it's quite a quite a big difference. Um, but also, um, we're, we're not trying to our, our main goal isn't to make a beer that's diacetyl free, it's to make a beer that tastes good. And I think that there's benefits from holding it cold, such as less sulfur production, less esters, higher alcohols. Um, that's why we don't do it. Right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you very much to George and Jeremy for, yeah, superb masterclass there. Um,